Okay. There's some there is something I call this the brutal, deliberate slaughter of the poor. So I'm sick and tired of the terms on which on this island and the neighboring islands the first world war is debated. As if it were sort of an abstract thing. There's something distasteful, if not actually disgusting, about the terms of the present debate in Ireland about the First World War. <clears throat> Much of the debate is not about the war itself, but consists largely in a bad-tempered exchange of views about what should or should not have been done in the Irish-British context, about whether it was right or wrong to strike for independence and arms, about whether or not the Irish people should have put their faith in home rule and its protagonists. In most of the argument, the level of actual historical knowledge seems to me appallingly low, not least among people who should know better. To take a single example, the happily inimitable <coughs> John Bruton seems entirely unaware that Home Rule promised an Irish Parliament that would have had fewer powers than a county council and cannot be in any way represented as even approaching self-determination. He seems not to know or chooses to forget that the Ulster volunteers were promised that if they joined the Ulster division en masse, there would be no home rule after the war, while the Irish volunteers, on joining the Irish division, were promised the exact opposite. He seems not to know or chooses to forget that the arming of the UVF in 1914, with the tacit connivance of members of the House of Lords and the effective mutiny of the British Army in Ireland, can only be properly understood as an act of armed insurrection against a legally constituted power, or in other words, the first rising of the 20th century in Ireland. What seems to me unforgivable is reducing debate on the war to merely debating the arcana of home rule vis-a-vis -vis armed national insurrection, giving this world historical sideshow such undue importance has the effect of drawing a smokescreen over the true origins, nature, and implications of the brute mechanical slaughter of the war. Slaughter that would usher in a century of total war. Now, nothing could be more futile than bringing to bear on an argument knowledge and perspective that could not by any conceivable means have been available to the original protagonists, as if by doing this one could somehow have a second bite at the apple of history. Yet, if we sidestep what were largely propaganda-driven or interest-driven narratives, there was plenty of analysis at the time, warning against war, aware of its true origins, and prescient about what would be its consequences. And once the guns began to thunder, few, if any of those involved in the killing, maiming, and dying had any illusions at all about what was really happening. In the words of French second lieutenant Alfred Joubert, writing in his diary about World War I just before he was killed, humanity is mad. It must be mad to do what it is doing. What a massacre. What scenes of horror and carnage. I cannot find words to translate my impressions. Hell cannot be so terrible. Men are mad. To occlude that truth, to deliberately ignore the mass testimony of the doomed, that seems to me an obscenity. No sane person would argue against remembering ancestors who died in past wars, nor against honoring their individual memories. But we should do them the greater honor of remembering exactly who they were, and why, and how, and for what they died. The vast majority of the casualties were the poor and the powerless, badly educated in most cases, moved largely by passions and fantasies that were crafted and put into circulation with the express purpose of recruiting cannon father. The lad from the Shankill who joined in order to fulfill some fantasy of soldiering died in the same mud as the farm labourer from Kerry who needed the army's pitiful pay, and both left their sacrificed bodies on the same barbed wire as did a deluded 17-year-old apprentice from Marseille, a railway apprentice from Stuttgart, or some bewildered Malaysian infantryman far, far away from home. What those men who enlisted had in common up to mid-1916 in the British Army when conscription was introduced was a mixture of boredom with narrow lives, a generous willingness to follow their pals, a wish to escape poverty, 
and above all, a naive belief in the fantasy narratives that the rich and powerful had spun for them. Many of those who soldiered had a largeness of heart. Many showed considerable courage. And most of them joined from a mix of motivations that were sometimes admirable, sometimes no more than unquestioning acceptance of whatever was the norm in their milieu. In some cases, and we should not flinch from saying so, men joined in order to experience what it was like to kill. With the knowledge subsequently available to us, we can see now that they died the fourth of the ambitions of callous, callous and cynical power elites who thought of these men and of their officers too as expendable carriers of arms, mere food for the guns. And after 1916, of course, with the coming of conscription, most of the soon to be dead had not even the comforting illusion that they came to the killing fields by choice. How to explain then the initial worldwide enthusiasm for this most cynical of wars, the battalions, regiments and divisions of men singing as they marched to the most brutal and squalid of deaths. In the more educated and thus more privileged sectors of contemporary society, it seems to most axiomatic nowadays that war is to be avoided at, al at almost any cost. And there are many among us who feel that war is to be avoided at any cost. This is perhaps an inevitable consequence of the horrors experienced by humanity in the course of the long and terrible 20th century. But it would perhaps surprise many to discover how recent a phenomenon this universal abhorrence of war is. We need constantly to remind ourselves that this complex and many-faceted war that would convulse all of Europe, that would reach out into the remotest corners of the world, was greeted almost everywhere with enthusiasm, not least among those fated to do the dying. Those who dismiss Pierce, Connolly, and the insurrectionists as aberrant near psychopaths obsessed with blood sacrifice need to remember, if they ever knew, that all across Europe, at all levels of society, the idea that national salvation could be mediated through blood sacrifice was everywhere prevalent and unremarked by most. The melancholy fact is, all of Europe by 1914 was bizarrely reconciled to the inevitability of war. It would not be going too far to say that there was not just a climate of resignation to war, but in many, many polities all across the continent, a grim relish at the prospect. In Britain, in 1910, a close friend of the reigning King Edward VII, Viscount Escher, could say, I quote, the idea of a prolonged peace is an idle dream. And two years later, to an audience of undergraduates in Cambridge University, he would speak of the poetic and romantic aspects of the clash of arms. In France, in 1913, reintroducing the three-year period of compulsory military service, the Chamber of Deputies embraced what it was pleased to call the prestige of war. In Germany that same year, the Army Bill saw a massive increase in expenditure on the Army with popular approval, while five years earlier, the Russian Duma had voted a succession of allocations to the Army far in excess of what the Army was actually able to spend. In Serbia, a particularly nihilistic and widely supported nationalism was pursuing an aggressive annexation of territories, <coughs> even at the, uh, including Albania, parts of Bulgaria, and a chunk of Macedonia, under the banner of reintegrating so-called national territories, even at the risk of war provoking war with Austria-Hungary, while on the other side of the world, buoyed up by their success against Russia in the war of 1905, the rising power of Japan was already heavily committed to a politics of war. By objective analysis, this readiness to pursue politics by means of war was a project of that power elite who stood most to benefit from the spoils. The armaments manufacturers, of course, but also that large class of investors who sought markets, materials and profits by the retention of or expansion into political or mercantile imperial possessions. What seems strange to us now, or should seem strange, was the enthusiasm of all those national populations for war, whether conceived as aggressive or defensive. 
what seems positively perverse to most of us perhaps, is the extraordinary willingness to die of those in all countries who stood to gain least from imperial wars. The urban working class and unemployed, the agrarian poor, the salaried serfs who staffed the low paid offices. That seems to us strange. And so does the enthusiasm of mothers, sisters, lovers, fathers and brothers that the young, predominantly the young, should, as a matter of honour, be prepared to offer up their lives to the mass funeral pyres that were, since the beginning of the century, inexorably being prepared. The young of Bulgaria, Serbia, Austria, Russia, France, Britain and Germany were prepared to slaughter each other for something as chimerical as imagined national honour. And the ruling classes of those and other countries were prepared to nurture and complacently manage this mass suicide, this mass murder, for no better end than an increase of profits, power and prestige. That is the blunt truth of it. If the poor, who would do the bulk of the dying, knew no better, it was because they were for the most part cruelly and neglectfully uneducated. If the officers who would lead and conduct the slaughter might or should have known better in our eyes, we need to make a deliberate effort of the imagination to understand that the complacent acceptance and embrace of war was almost completely pervasive in all European societies of that time. For most of us, most of the time, standing outside the norms and realities of a given society, it is next to impossible to take an independent stance of mind to resist the orthodoxy of the given moment. Here in Ireland, James Connolly certainly seems to have had a clear and consistent understanding that the Great War in its conception and in its bloody flowering was no more than a war between capitalist powers for a control of resources, a war between empires which would have no outcome in the expansion of post-war social justice, but would instead result in a widening and deepening of injustice and exploitation. In polemic after polemic, in newspaper articles and speeches, he laid out this analysis. That history has shown him to have been correct is neither here nor there. The men in the trenches of the Somme, Ypres and Passchendaele, on the barren heights of the Tyrol, and in the unspeakable conditions of the Russian front, would eventually experience the truth of his analysis, or at least elements of that truth, in the ice, mud, blood and entrails of unprecedented slaughter. <coughs> the mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers of the dead would see, staring into their dying fires when the guns had fallen silent, the faces of loved ones who had died for a nullity, honourably in many individual cases, but for the vast majority in mute, uncomprehending despair. The English poet Wilfred Owen would eventually recognise the brute reality of it all. This is a poem now you might want to stop your ears. Dolce et decorum est. Bent double like old beggars on their sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man on fire or in lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children 
ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. The subject of gas, incidentally. Mm -hmm. It was France, not Germany, which was the first country to use gas against enemy troops in August 1914. In January 1915, Germany first used tear gas against Russian armies, and in April 1915, the Germans were the first to use poisonous chlorine gas. During World War I, the Germans released about 68,000 tonnes of gas, and the British and French released 51,000 tonnes. In total, 1,200,000 soldiers on both sides were gassed, of whom 91,198 were to die. Owen saw through it all, but late, very late. And had he not been in thrall at the start of the war to a chimerical vision of England, he might have seen through the rhetoric of nationalist propaganda to the bloody and visceral reality of what war would actually be like. Another way of saying this would be if he had possessed an analytic perspective. Connolly did possess such an analytic perspective which is a way of saying he did not subscribe to illusions, no matter how seductively and romantically framed. In the newspaper Workers' Republic, 20th of August, 1898, he wrote, The cabinets who rule the destinies of nations from the various capitals of Europe are but the tools of the moneyed interest. Their quarrels are not dictated by sentiments of national pride or honour, but by the avarice and lust of power on the part of the class to which they belong. People who fight under their banners in the various armies or navies do indeed imagine they are fighting the battles of their own country. But in what country has it ever happened that the people have profited by foreign conquest? His analysis was global. In the same article he wrote, the mad scramble for wealth which this century has witnessed has resulted in lifting almost every European country into the circle of competition for trade. New machinery, New inventions, new discoveries in the scientific world have all been laid under contribution as aids to industry until the wealth producing powers of society at large have far outstripped the demand for goods. And now those very powers we have conjured up from the bosom of nature threaten to turn and rend us. Every new labour saving machine at one and the same time by reducing the number of workers needed reduces the demand for goods which the worker cannot buy while increasing the power of producing goods and thus permanently increases the numbers of unemployed and shortens the period of industrial prosperity. Competition between capitalists drives them to seek for newer and more efficient well-producing machines, but as the home market is now no longer able to dispose of their produce, they are driven to foreign markets. In order to explore this question further now, and to help break the undue emphasis that we in Ireland tend to place on the Irish-British perspective, I thought it might be helpful to focus on the situation from the other side of the trenches, so to speak. At the time when Connolly was writing, German industrial production was leaping ahead in the period of post-Bismarck national consolidation, modernising at a speed and to a depth unmatched by any other European country. The German trade union movement was the most advanced in Europe. This in the face of a highly reactionary political leadership, an army general staff and a cabal of powerful industrialists advocating for war. All this in conjunction with a mentally unstable Kaiser. Germany was racing ahead as an industrial power, largely as a result of carefully retained capital and a skilled and hard-working working class. And at the same time, Union membership had leaped from 851,000 in 1900 to 3,024,000 in 1913, a fact that gave pause for thought to a ruling class all too aware of the lessons of 1905 in Russia, including the great risings and demonstrations of workers there, and in particular the Kronstadt mutiny. There was every possibility that the increasing power of the unions would form the base for a revolutionary insurrection a possibility that would be neatly forestalled by embarking on a war. At the same time, the British trade union movement was sluggish, jingoistic and timid, more than happy to support reactionary craft unions in Ireland as satellite operations, and ill-disposed towards Larkin's and Connolly's aims of building a revolutionary independent union in Ireland. 
in Connolly's analysis, Germany then, with its politically conscious unions, was a more promising ally than the colonial part of Britain and its unorganized, even apolitical, working class. It is necessary to understand these things in order to grasp why Connolly had no qualms about accepting aid from Germany at a time when that country was on a collision course towards war with Great Britain. We now need also to bear in mind that working class power based in the trade union movement and in left-wing political parties and groupings was a growing political force right across Europe, across, in fact, what would become the demarcation lines of the war. It is difficult to resist the conclusion that for the small but dominant power cabals in London, Moscow, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, and so on, driven by nationalist and selfish interests as they were, the rise of a pan-European labor movement was a significant threat. You might say that they gambled on the proposition that flag-waving jingoism would triumph among the poor and powerless over objective consideration of their own best interests. And, to varying degrees, they were right. Some of the advocates of war in Germany were quite explicit. Ulrich Breitbach in the Green European Journal has the following quote. Paul Reich, general director of the Oberhausen Gute Hoffnung Iron Works, and one of the hawkish agitators for war declared, if we want to conduct global politics, then we have to give England a bloody nose and expand our territory westward. <coughs> These were not the views of mavericks or outsiders. Establishing German economic dominance in Central Europe and territorial gains in Belgium, Luxembourg, Northern France, and the East, and even in Africa, were the stated objectives of German government policy. <coughs> As against this, Breitbach also points out that the 1907 International Socialist Congress in Stuttgart agreed on the following resolution. If a war threatens to break out, it is the duty of the working classes and their parliamentary representatives in the countries involved to exert every effort in order to prevent the outbreak of war by the means they consider most effective. In case war should break out anyway, it is their duty to intervene in favor of its speedy termination and with all their powers to utilize the economic and political crisis created by the war to rouse the masses and thereby to hasten the downfall of capitalist class rule. In other words, right across Europe, what you have is a rising tide of agitation among the powerful for dominance in domestic and in foreign markets, for expansion of imperial interests in order to create new markets for their manufactured goods and to acquire raw materials. At the same time, a working class that was beginning to become conscious of itself and of its political power, which needed in each individual country and across the whole spectrum of countries to be curbed. And there is no better way to curb the growing rise of the poor and burnish them with a happy little war. This commitment to a transnational revolutionary anti-war policy was reaffirmed in 1912, as late as 25th of July, just a month after the Sarajevo assassination, and only a few days before the beginning of the World War, the German Social Democratic Party had appealed to the government to withhold from any kind of military intervention. An appeal to the proletariat went on to say, to delay court's danger, a world war is threatening. The ruling classes who in time of peace gag you, despise you and exploit you, would use you as cannon fodder. We will have no war. Down with war. Long live the International Brotherhood of Peoples. An interesting book called Germany in 1900, we read. By 1900, Germany had split into two cultures. One was a conservative, authoritarian, business-driven group that was very wary of the working class, while the other was the working class that greatly benefited in the time in Germany known as the Gründerzeit, the good times. The tensions that could have existed were disguised because Germans were doing so well. However, when the good times started to unravel, these tensions came to the surface. <clears throat> a not uncommon practice when this occurred was to rally your people around a state leader by having a successful foreign policy. In an imperial sense, Germany was well behind the UK. German South West Africa did not have the same cachet as South Africa, India or Canada, for example. What better way to express your newfound power than by having an arms building program so that you at least rivaled your nearest opponent. <clears throat>
bear in mind that while Germany is taking this perspective, Britain is looking at the possible that this as an enormous challenge to the imperial positions on which its power and mercantile interests depend. Now, by a process that is still being analysed by contemporary historians, the leadership of the German trade union movement, in defiance of their own better standing, understanding, finally allow themselves to be seduced in supporting the war. Some union officials even arguing for supporting the war on the grounds that a German victory would be good for the economy and therefore for jobs. Connolly was aware that the poor of Ireland would die in Flanders mud in a war for spoils between imperial powers, that British recruitment in Ireland was cynical and mendacious. In the Workers' Republic, 8 of April 1916, 16 days before the rising new vote, that the young men of Ireland might be seduced into the service of the nation that denies every national power to their country. We have seen appeals made to our love of freedom, to our religious instincts, to our sympathy for the oppressed, to our kinship with suffering. He went on, the power that for 700 years has waged bitter and unrelenting war upon the freedom of Ireland, and that still declares that the rights of Ireland must forever remain subordinate to the interests of the British Empire, hypocritically appealed to our young men to enlist under her banner and shed their blood in the interests of freedom. He went on to say, the power which holds in subjection more of the world's population than any other power on the globe, and holds them in subjection as slaves without any guarantee of freedom or power of self-government. This power that sets Catholic against Protestant, the Hindu against the Mohammedan, the yellow man against the brown, and keeps them quarrelling with each other while she robs and murders them all, this power appeals to Ireland to send her sons to fight under England's banner for the cause of the oppressed. The power whose rule in Ireland has made of Ireland a desert and made the history of our race read like the records of a shambles as she plans for the annihilation of another race appeals to our manhood to fight for her because of our sympathy for the suffering and our hatred of oppression. Of course, what Connolly says here of the British Empire, which is true in its way, if a little colourfully expressed, could be usefully expanded to the other competent nations Gallant little Belgium, for instance, in whose defence so many were exhorted to volunteer, was a vicious colonial power, barbaric and inhuman in its treatment of the people of the Congo. Reports have come to light in the last 20 years, for instance, of thousands of children having their hands amputated to punish their parents for refusing to work in the Belgian rubber plantations. You can go online and see a room this size, filled, a pile that would fill this room, of hands of children. Not for anything the children did, but because their parents had refused to work in the Belgian rubber plantations. This was gallant little Catholic Belgium to whose aid John Redmond wanted to dispatch his volunteers. Colonial officials were routinely photographed, standing proudly by piles of hands like this. The Russian Empire, reeling still from the attempted insurrection and the forced concessions of 1905, was savage in its treatment of the rural and industrial poor as it was in its treatment of its internal political opponents. The Serbs and Bulgarians appear to have had a reciprocal atrocity pact. The German army, as a matter of deliberate policy, undertook planned and appalling massacres of civilians in order to spread terror as a means of overcoming resistance. There were courses in the staff colleges on how to do this. The Turks took advantage of the war to perpetrate genocide against the Armenians, one and a half million dead, and behind all this <coughs> savagery, stood the powerful elites who guided the fortunes of their countries, who manufactured the weapons, who stood as the ultimate beneficiaries of victory should it come about, with its expanded empires, new markets, new sources of raw materials. Now I have no wish to simplify the extraordinary chains of circumstance that led to the outbreak of war, and to anyone interested in making sense of this very complex question, I strongly recommend the excellent work of Christopher Clarke, in his magisterial book published in 2012, The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914. It's possibly the single best historic book I've ever read. That said, I want to hammer home one simple and brutal fact. It was the poor of the world, overwhelmingly, who did the killing and dying in this unspeakable war. I do not hesitate to say the First World War was no more than the pursuit 
of rival political advantages by means of the organised slaughter of the poor. 1914 was the point when the Industrial Revolution caught up with war. The bulk of the military casualties fell not to rifle fire, but to sophisticated artillery, machine guns and poison chemicals, all products of mechanised industry, products produced for profit by a system that had already all but succeeded in defining workers not as individual human beings, human in the same way as their owners and masters, but as an abstract element in the forces of production, a workforce. For those who had charge of the war, it was of the first importance to ensure that those not directly engaged in the war should be kept ignorant of the scale and the brute savagery of what was happening, to what the general staff thought of as components in their great machines, but were otherwise, in another dimension of reality, sons, fathers, lovers, brothers, neighbours, school friends, shopkeepers, postmen, teachers, and so on. Individual human beings, in other words, made of flesh and blood, gifted, as we all are, with one life and one life only. The British government, to take one example, went to such great lengths to conceal the real nature of the war from their populations that they even threatened to execute journalists who wrote realistically of what was happening at the front. Here's a story from the BBC. Daily Chronicle report of Philip Gibbs at 37 <coughs> was in France when the war broke out. In the early months of the war, he toured the war zone undercover. He had to be resourceful in getting his dispatches back to Fleet Street, evading the French or British authorities to deliver his stories to London himself. At another time, he bribed the purser of a cross-channel steamer and even managed to get his dispatches delivered by the war office itself, courtesy of an official king's messenger. <coughs> Gibbs was arrested more than once, but kept returning to the front. He was finally captured in 1915 at the Havre. He remained under arrest for 10 days before the base commander, General Hugh Bruce Williams, warned him that if he persisted in returning to the front line, he would be put up against a white wall with, quote, unpleasant consequences. <coughs> Gibb wrote that he thought his time as a war reporter had come to an end. He managed to struggle on. And at a reception held for him in London Savoy Hotel on the 27th of December 1917, when the tide had very much begun to turn, Philip Gibbs spoke movingly of his wartime experiences. That he was honoured in this way showed just how much the official view of war reporters had softened after three years of relentless slaughter. Among those at the dinner was Prime Minister David Lloyd George, who was reportedly shocked by Gibbs' account of the war. The following day, Lloyd George confided that the British public should never be allowed to learn, quote, the true nature of this bloody business. Just how much he was moved by Gibbs' account of his wartime experiences became clear in the conversation he had the next day. C.P. Scott, the Manchester Guardian editor, then revealed that Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, told him in private, if people really knew what was going on, the war would be stopped tomorrow. But of course, he said, they don't know it, and they can't know it. The correspondents don't write it, and the censors wouldn't let the truth pass. Gibbs' speech, like his dispatches from the front line, had a powerful impact affecting newspaper editors, as well as the British Prime Minister himself. Bear in mind that Gibbs wanted to report the truth as much as possible, but with this qualification, as he put it, we identified ourselves absolutely with the armies in the field, and we wiped out of our minds all thought of personal scoops. There was no need of censorship in our dispatches. We were our own censors. Question naturally arises, what exactly was being kept from the home populations? Well, no more and no less than what the war was actually like. Or, if you prefer, what it was like actually to be doing the fighting and dying. What it was like to be, say, a plowman from Shropshire or Salzburg or a herdsman from Slane, spending weeks at a time in the mud and slime of a trench, never dry, your clothes crawling with lice, an appalling stink of cordite and dead meat hanging so thick in the air that the taste of it is in your breath, your hair, your skin, and cannot be scrubbed away. What it was like to be deafened morning at night by the overwhelming thunder of the guns, to stand in the dark, 
listening to the moaning and screaming of friends and strangers, slowly dying of their wounds just over the lip of the trench you are crouched in, shaking with fear. <coughs> the stink of piss and shit as often as not brought on by sheer terror. To live morning and night for weeks and months on end in a state of terror. To feel every day your grasp on your own <coughs> sanity slipping away. To know that if the dread moment arrives when you just can't take any more, your own officers will shoot you out of hand. To know that the moment will come when you will be ordered to climb a rickety ladder, perhaps already slippery and stinking with the blood of the man in front of you, and walk out at dawn into a mud that is not just sodden earth and clay, but the guts and the bones and blood of other human beings, into an inferno of explosions, tangled with mountains of barbed wire already draped with the dead and dying, into a storm of lead so dense that it rivals the heaviest downpour of rain you have ever been caught in. To know that it is almost certain you will never get out of this inferno alive, that any moment, literally any moment, could be your last on this earth. To be driven almost to madness by the thought of all you will never know or touch or taste or see again, a familiar street corner, your own kitchen table, your mother's hand on your neck or your wife's, your lover's, the smell of a child's hair, the look in a child's eye, your dog leaping for a ball, the feel of a fresh washed shirt as you pull it on of a summer's morning. These ordinary, simple things that taken together make up the sum of a life, never to be known now. What must that have been like? What was it like to know, deep in your bones and in your very soul, that to the commanders, to the politicians at home, to the press men who whip up the war to Syria, the women who hand out the white feathers, the men who sell to the armies, the gun in your hand, the scanned food in your belly, the uniform rotting on your body, the guns and shells that make the thunder, the lethal mechanical shattering machine guns, the curse barbed wire, that invention of the devil, the men who profit from the very stretcher you might just be carried back on should you be lucky enough to be wounded, found and carried back. To know that to all these you are lower than an animal, of less value than a mule or a horse, to know that to all these you are no more than the lowest of the brutes. What must that have been like? If we don't know, it is not because there was anywhere a conspiracy to silence any such possible witness. It is because the vast majority of those who survived hell had no words to speak of it, with the exception of Eric Mahmoud and indeed Liam O'Flaherty, we rely on a handful of officers among the British Graves, Sassoon and a few others for testimony. We have little or no direct account of what it was like to be one of those faceless millions of the poor sent to the war to feed the insatiable appetite of the guns. In large part, this is because, and this compounds the tragedy for me, the vast majority of those who did the killing and the dying had not the education, the power in language, to describe what they had been through. That, and the often obscured fact, that for many, if not most survivors, recollection, no matter how generalized, brought on unbearable trauma and unendurable nightmares. Simply put, their post-war survival mechanism to shut down, to take refuge in silence and forgetting. In the Irish context, it is for ahistoric and far too simple-minded to lay the blame for this enduring silence on post-independence hostility to those who fought under Britain's flag. These men did not speak of their experiences because neurasthenia and nightmare held their tongues. This silence is universally reported among survivors and is not peculiar to Ireland. There was, of course, a degree of hostility in public life with a party political cause. But given the huge numbers involved, Given that these survivors had large numbers of friends, relatives and descendants, it is difficult to believe that their stories were not widely known, that there was not a huge degree of sympathy for these survivors on a human level. The charge laid against the Easter Week insurrectionists was that they stabbed the British Empire in the back. There was a corresponding reaction that those who fought in an army that was opposing Irish independence were stabbing their country in the back. Both of these positions are as offensive as they are absurd. The men who answered Redmond's appeal volunteered for many and diverse reasons, as mentioned above. But the vast majority of those who thought of it at all believed that in some vague way 
that were furthering Ireland's cause. There were, of course, some who consciously took up arms for empire, considering themselves loyal subjects of the crown, and this was, in their own terms, a legitimate position. There were others who sincerely believed they were fighting in British uniform for the interests of their country. There is, however, a greater truth. They fought, and in many cases died, as did their counterparts in all the armies, for the Chimera, a delusion and illusion carefully and deliberately fostered by poor elites who had little or no consideration for them as human beings. It is both possible and necessary to say this. I believe that there is a moral imperative to acknowledge this overwhelming truth of history. And to accept this truth is to stand up <coughs> for those men, the dead and the survivors, in the name of what was done to them. It is not to denigrate their honour, their courage, their many and complex human loyalties, but in truth, the very opposite. It is to retrieve their dignity from the fog of war and from petty men and women who would suborn their sacrifice in the name of a mean, intellectually dishonest and petty politics.